Fantastic, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marian Klein. I'm with Boulder Environmental Sciences and Technology, and we are developing sensors for better observations. And those observations are useful to provide data from the atmosphere, something like temperature, humidity profiles, um, cloud uh, and cloud par uh, parameters. Um, we can observe also rain and uh, um, snow, uh, in, our, in other words, precipitation in, other f in different forms, and also surface parameters, something like a sea, uh, or ocean or wind vector or the sea ice coverage. On the, you know, we have here a sensor uh, shown as a buoy-based sensor for that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, and um, the, the principle of the sensor is basically works like a human eye. It, that means that it receives the electromagnetic waves which already exist in the environment, and it basically detects the environment based on that uh, radiation that comes to the sensor. The sensor is microwave, so that means that it works in a very uh, wide range of the wavelength, from one, tera from one gigahertz, which is about 30 centimeter wavelength, to about uh, one terahertz, which is about 0.3 centimeters or three human air hairs thick. And uh, that allows observations of many different uh, things. So what I have pointed out here is, you know, why would we use uh, microradiometry and this is a study by, on the first panel, there is a study by the ECMWF that shows uh, forecast error reduction by different types of technology. And you see the microreometers in space provide something like 35% um, uh, error reduction in forecasts, uh, comparing to where they are not, not involved in, for, in data. Um, so main, our goal is basically package this sensor to a very small volume, make them economical, make them more accurate, better calibrated, so they can be deployed on different platforms that are illustrated here. Like, for example, there is a microimager for space application, which is a 12-view CubeSat with deployable antenna. The second one is the uh, sounder, which is similar to the uh, spacecraft which already exists, but much smaller. We are developing deployable antenna we are de uh, for such sensors. We are also developing a buoy-based sensor for offshore wind farms. Um, and uh, we also have uh, uh, interest in the NASA, from NASA to fly our airborne sensor on the aircraft. Next slide. And uh, this is an example of uh, how this new technology compares with the, with the currently existing technology. So on the right side, you see advanced technology micro sounder, which is basically a walking horse from um, uh, space for, for uh, microwave measurements. And on the left side, you see a 12-view CubeSat to which you can package more of the capabilities than you see on the right side. And the cost is uh, probably, you know, for, for the cost of constellation of 15 satellites would be probably less than one sensor, which is flying on one satellite today. That's it. Thank you very much. Very well, thank you. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Jacobowski. I'm the CEO of iFusion. And um, unlike everybody else here, I have no education. So I thought I, it was prudent for me to add some of my history here, which equates to an education. I started out in the industry, feet moving, feet on the ground, working in the industry as um, an additive tech in industrial design in 91. So if you do the math, that means I have 27 years experience in additive manufacturing. So I've carried that through my career in these multiple different companies, in these multiple different uh, roles, engineering-wise and, and learning on the ground, uh, developing products, developing companies and um, technologies. So I've had first-hand experience with that. And that's led me to uh, start my own company in 2010. I started iFusion. And what I saw was the need for design for additive manufacturing, engineering for additive manufacturing. A lot of people knew what it was, but they didn't know how to adopt it and how to use it. So we are a professional 3D printing company. We do offer the services, and we also offer design and engineering services. Next slide, please. So more credibility is um, the process control parameters documents that I authored 
There's over 15 that I did. These are some examples. Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Bell Helicopter, just to name a few. I know exactly what it takes to take additive and put it on manned flight hardware and unmanned flight hardware. The example, uh, the images I have is a great story. This is uh, the Excalibur missile program. Traditionally, this is a cast part, a cast alloy part out of uh, titanium. And they came to me and said, we're in trouble. We have this program we have to fit in in 36 months. We need to get it done in 12. What can you do? At the time, this was about 12, 15 years ago, there were only two machines in the United States printing titanium. So I commissioned those machines. We printed the parts out of titanium, post-machined those parts, and we were able to rapidly test and fire, redesign, test, and fire. We did 36 iterations in 12 weeks. We saved $1.6 million and finished the program in total in 24 weeks. So that's where additive really has um, some legs to stand on. This was a long time ago. Additives uh, made a lot of improvements since then. Uh, next slide, please. So that's what we do with my, at my company. We help consult you with your TRL level. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? And what can, what can we help you do? We can write the roadmap for you. We can offer you the services so we can print the parts for you. We can help design and engineer the parts for you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to provide the solution that works for you. Thank you. Stay to me, high folks. So hi, I'm Hans Brunner. I'm the CEO of Data Me. We're a Denver-based startup focused on data science, and we have a mission to bring AI and machine learning to data science and change all that. Can I have the next slide, please? Ooh, that didn't work out so well. Um, we are at the cusp of a, of a paradigm shift uh, based on these advances in machine learning. What we do is causal modeling. And this is changing the way in which we understand past, present, and future. If this had been around when I was a young academic, it would have completely changed how I approach science. So if, to give you a feel for it, I put up scientist Tony Cox, but the book that I really love is The Book of Why. It's a wonderful title by Judea Pearl. This is really a different way of viewing variants and how we can predict the future. Um, <clears throat> we've used this for uh, predicting upcoming uh, IT performance degradation. I'm using it right now to, in dairy production to predict how uh, different feed mixes relate to changing weather conditions for dairy production. These are complex multidimensional problems. Um, we use this uh, the airport to predict uh, the impact of TSA wait times and how much people spend at restaurants and bars. It's, it's very interesting stuff. So uh, normally if you want to use do causal analytics, you have to go to the R consortium and find the R, R packages and write R programs, and that's very complex, both because you have to learn R and because of the wealth of unorganized packages that are there. We have created a product called the Causal Analytics Toolkit, which eliminates that, eliminates the need for multiple months of training and exposure, and uh, creates a nice seamless left to right causal analytics tool set that saves a ton of time. Now, we license it, but as you can imagine, the world hasn't exactly been stampeding our doors for it. So what we are focusing on right now is to be a causal analytics solution company, going into different industries such as dairy, do the discovery, find out which causal forces are the significant ones. And the thing about causal modeling is that it tells you, if I turn the knob this much, how much is it going to turn that? It's unidirectional, which is very different from the kinds of correlation-based statistics most people do today. So these are very, very powerful models. So we're going to go in there, taking dairy as an example. We can predict it. We can create that model. We can resell it online over and over. There are 40,000 dairy farmers in the country. That's how we'd like to make money. Now, if the world wants to start licensing our product, that's great as well. Can we go to the next slide? So to give you a feel for this, on the upper, um, this will resonate with our last speaker, on the upper left-hand corner, we have a Bayesian network uh, looking at, which, which shows you the network of forces that, that drive how much liquid water there is in a cubic meter of sky. This is a Boulder startup company. 
And as you can see, you know, uh, barometric pressure, number of thousand feet above ground, relative humidity, vapor density, these all have a direct impact on how much water there is in a cubic meter of sky, but they also influence each other. Right? So this is the way nature works. Nature works in these ecosystems of forces that have a direct unidirectional causal impact to drive how much of something occurs that we're trying to predict. Right? This is a really different way of looking at data and predicting the future. So what we go is we go in and we do our discovery, and then our, our preferred deliverable is not just the discovery insights, but Bayesian simulation engines, and that's what's in the middle. All right? So this is the Bayesian simulation engine that corresponds to that Bayesian network on top. And this is an engine that is a piece of code that you can use, either thinking backwards, starting with how much water, what's the world look like when I have this amount of water? Or what, if I have this amount of water and I'm at this height, what other conditions must occur? Because this maintains the conditional probabilities between these things. But, so we can use it in that form, but typically we deliver it as a dashboard. So um, that's, that's us, we're lean, we're mean. We placed top 25 this year in NASA's iTech competition based on our submission for how we'd like to slice and dice big data better with this stuff. And we're excited to be at the beginning of this uh, technology adoption curve. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we're very excited to be here uh, talking about a couple of technologies, but first to introduce the company. Uh, we are a small business located in Torrance, California, and uh, we are a woman-owned private. We founded in 2002. We started as a 3,000 square foot facility and now expanded. We have a chemical sensor division and a biotechnology division, but today I'll be talking a little bit about some coatings. Uh, we've grown from three and a half employees to 30 employees over the years, and uh, we have a patent portfolio, some issued and some uh, <coughs> under various stages of filing. Uh, the next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about two technologies uh, that may be of relevance. I wasn't aware that, we I thought we were pitching to the Air Force, so this is sort of customized to that. Sorry. So the two technologies that we're, um, uh, we're focusing on, this is the coding technologies that we've developed through the SBIR program. The first one is an anti-fog treatment that we developed for, from funding from the CBD, and uh, we won a phase three through the DITRA RIF program. <clears throat> and could you place the video, please? Here, we we'll compare a coded lens on the left to a non-coded lens on the right. Now we place both lenses over the water vapor to begin testing. This test simulates unit conditions that can cause fogging in parent visibility. As you can see, the uncoded lens has fogged up, but the coded lens remains clear. Thank you. So, uh, what the coding offers, uh, it's an excellent demisting capability. We've tested it up to 30 minutes under these conditions at 60, you know, generating vapors. Uh, we have specialty nano additives that we've added into the coating to improve its chemical and mechanical abrasion resistance because it's been put through the paces with a whole lot of chemicals that they field, uh, they encounter in the field. And uh, with all of that, it retains its optical properties. That's the key thing. And we recently completed a user analysis event at Seattle. The ChemBio unit used it, and the users actually wanted to use this uh, thing the next day. They didn't want to return the mass, uh, face mask to us. We're working with Avon Protection Systems, who's making the M50 mask, but the same thing can be used for the Air Force for the JSAM masks, as I understand. So that's one of the things, and there are other Air Force applications. And I'd like to go to the next slide. Uh, one other technology that uh, we're developing also through the SBIR program, we're in a phase two funding from uh, DOE. There's a mercury problem at Oak Ridge, and we are developing a smart coating. We call it trap and see because the coating captures the uh, toxic metal as well as uh, enables you to see it. And so you have to see examples of uh, mercury detection. We've done some feasibility studies for cadmium and chromium because I understand that uh, grit blasting during repairs, there's chromium and cadmium things. And we tried to submit a RIF, but we weren't successful. But we'd like to talk to the right people and promote this technology. 
So we're actually going into a demo that uh, we're working with a company uh, called ICM, who's building the wall climbing robot. And we will be doing a live demo at Oak Ridge for the mercury remediation. And that little uh, snippet there is actually during the original phase two, we did uh, do a, a small scale demo and they were able to capture several micrograms of mercury within the paint. Thank you. Uh, the, so the Air Force has, um, how would you describe it, like a research and development innovation arm called AFRX, and they were just looking for technologies to help improve uh, helmets. So I'm gonna make an introduction. <laughs> but uh, there's some really cool programs uh, in the DOD if you're not familiar with them. Um, they're doing Air Force special cyber topics. They just did uh, two rounds, 18.2 and 18.3. And they were giving companies with amazing innovations 50 to $75,000 to do a phase one cyber. Um, and I th believe they're gonna continue that, that program through uh, 19 and probably into 20. So that's been very successful for many companies within the Catalyst Campus ecosystem and beyond. So I would keep a uh, lookout for those programs, those special topics, subbers that are released. But we, you need company is Exodus Space Corporation. How many 100% fully reusable launch vehicles exist today? or have ever been in operation in the history of the world? Zero. 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 The answer is zero. My name is Miguel, International Space Station, as well as the NASA Space Shuttle. Next, please. Our team at Exodus is composed of veterans of NASA, as well as veterans of top aerospace companies. Our guys have been building launch vehicles and spacecraft since the Apollo era. We have what it takes to build the very first fully reusable launch vehicle. What we have here today is the Astro Clipper. We're developing this vehicle to be a 20 passenger, one of a kind, fully reusable launch vehicle that will be designed for that's intended to be the most affordable, reliable, multi-purpose space liner. <clears throat> ladies, ladies and gentlemen, this is the breakthrough that we've been looking for to dramatically reduce the cost of access to space. This is the vehicle that will meet the current demands, the current growing demands of uh, affordable launch services as well as in space operations. This vehicle will operate, will, will launch horizontally and uh, land horizontally. It's, it's a two-stage to orbit system here. Next slide, please. The services that we will offer will be space tourism, crew and cargo transport, mass satellite deployment, on-orbit satellite servicing, space debris collection. <clears throat> Within four to five years, we intend to have a, uh, an unmanned prototype, small version that's, that's fully functional, that can be purposed for uh, satellite services. And it could, it could start creating revenue so that we can continue developing the, uh, the human-rated full-scale version that would be operational by 2030, and it would be purposed for space tourism as well as uh, crew transport. What uh, we're looking for here is uh, suppliers, potential partners, and um, I'm sorry, we're looking for seed investors, we're looking for suppliers and uh, uh, partners, future VC investors, and uh, future customers. So hopefully you can join us in our journey. In fact, today I saw a bunch of people that we could work with, actually. We're looking at different forms of, of uh, advanced uh, methods of doing things, ladder structures. Please come talk to us. Hopefully we can exchange some business, uh, business cards. So join us in our journey. Orbit with us. Thank you. He is MMA Design LLC. Thanks. My name is Mark Bailey. I'm the Business Development Director of MMA Design. We are a custom uh, deployable systems company. So we specialize in packaging 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound package. Um, we have two key product areas. Next slide. The first is 
big antennas. Um, the problem is as satellites get small, you sacrifice on two things. You sacrifice on your ability to, f to put data through at the satellite or generate data from the satellite and to get it down to Earth. There's two things that you have to keep big even if the satellite gets small. One is the antenna and one is the solar array. You need power and you need data transfer capability. So we've been, come up with a way to better package antennas so we can package extremely large antennas onto extremely small satellites, uh, thus lowering the cost of getting that capacity to orbit. Next slide. And more power. We can package lots of power onto a very small satellite to the point where getting rid of the heat becomes the, the, your biggest problem. So that's it. Awesome, the Mark's time. That, just kidding, just kidding. So um, good afternoon. My name is Aliris Allman, and I am the founder of Deep Space Predictive. And we are here to get uh, feedback on a new concept that we're developing with our business. And our business is using interdisciplinary research to develop new technology in behavioral science. And that interdisciplinary researchers, we work in psychology, we work in computer science, data science, um, obviously business, but also in Tibetan medicine. So one of our doctors is a PhD in Tibetan medicine and in computer science and systems engineering. So this behavioral technology is meant to enable and empower humans to work autonomously in harsh and isolated conditions to enable mission success. So that's what we're trying to do with Deep Space Predictive. And why is that important? Let me give you an example. So I don't know if you heard recently in the news, there was um, an incident in an Antarctic isolation study. One crew member stabbed another crew member. So they didn't stab them for a reason that you would think, you know, hoarding resources, not doing their work, or something like that. It was something much more mundane. mundane. They stabbed them because they were telling the ending of books that they were reading. Yes, that, I mean, something as simple as that. So in normal circumstances, that's just, you know, we would be able to manage that. But in this circumstance, it was almost fatal. He stabbed him in the heart. So we believe that our technology would have minimized that situation to be more of maybe a verbal argument or better yet, preventing it altogether. So why is that important? Because a multi-million dollar mission was jeopardized because of this type of human error. And what we're trying to do is basically say if that mission were redesigned with not just the old thinking of human is part of the process, a piece of a puzzle, but really the design that the human is the loop. Can I have a slide? So the human is a loop is a different way of thinking of developing a mission process. So as we go through and do our efforts in human exploration, we are pushing the boundaries of technology, we're pushing the boundaries of the human body, but most importantly, the boundaries of the human mind. And if you talk to people who have been in isolation or in missions, they truly underestimate the importance of interpersonal relationships. If you ask you know, on exit interviews, all those crew members say, oh my gosh, those interpersonal relationships were harder than I thought. And it impacted the really the success or their perception of success in that mission. So what we plan to do is because many of these missions are, um, you're expecting the company and the crew to be self-sufficient, that we um, enable them to maintain their autonomy. We give them training and countermeasures so that they can maintain that autonomy and do their own intervention. And doing that own intervention gives them the ability to manage themselves throughout the whole process. So what does our technology do? Slide. So our technology is predictive technology. We believe that we have the technology to be able to predict when a breakdown will happen. Because guess what? It's going to happen. There's no denying it. And I think that's what happens in most missions, is people don't believe that we'll get to the point of a stabbing. And guess what? It happened. It may not have happened to that degree in other points, but a lot of missions have been jeopardized because the interpersonal breakdowns between individuals. We do measurements that make sure that the team is intact and they have the ability. We don't use artificial intelligence, we use intelligent augmentation because we want the individuals and the humans to be able to make their own decisions 
and to be able to maintain themselves so they will not become an object of AI direction. And bottom line is we want to make the human a highly evolved human.